Hello and welcome to our presentation. Today we're going to be talking about requests for evidence issued by USCIS. I'm your host, Jennifer Grady from the Grady Firm, and we have offices in Beverly Hills, Irvine, and San Diego, California. I'm here today with our lead immigration attorney, Anthony Sam, and we'll be talking about tips and strategies for responding to requests for evidence. We'll go uh, through what they are, um, some procedural things, and then some tips that can help you prepare a winning response. So, welcome, Anthony, and uh, tell us a little bit about what is a request for evidence. So, a request for evidence is a request that's coming from USCIS in response to a particular immigration benefit that has been applied for. So, for instance, if you're applying for an H-1B visa uh, petition, then after the application is submitted and USCIS has done its initial overview of the case, they may feel that there's more evidence they need that has not been submitted in order to make a full adjudication of the case. So they will send a letter that uh, essentially does exactly what it says. It's requesting additional evidence to make a decision in the case. And what kind of cases might our audience receive an RFE on? Well, RFEs can, you know, occur in virtually any type of case that is brought before United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, you know, they're more prevalent, I would say, with employment-based non-immigrant applications such as H-1Bs, L-1s, O-1s, uh, simply because those are very evidence-heavy uh, applications, um, but that doesn't mean they couldn't occur with, you know, personal marriage-based green card cases or uh, fiancé visa cases, basically anything that requires an applicant to send evidence in could be subject to a request for evidence. And on the marriage-based green card, RFEs might come about to show that you have enough money to support the person that you're applying for, um, evidence related to finances and financial mm -hmm. support. Um, so where have we have seen an uptick would be definitely in the employment-based um, immigration benefits, either green card or uh, non-immigrant visa, and that's really over the last year to two years that we've seen this uptick. And so this is on, for example, the L1A, L1B, or H1B, and so they've really been honing in on certain topics that we will talk about in a little bit. And so even if you do have a great application that has almost everything we've seen that USCIS is pushing back um, on that. And so we're not sure if it is to delay it or what directives there are, but we do know that if you have an RFE, you do have to respond. If you don't, your application will be abandoned. So it's really the opportunity for you to say, this is something that I really want and here's how I'm going to prove it. So um, RFEs are usually due uh, the maximum of three months, um, but we recommend that you do that as soon as possible. So between two weeks to a month, you want to have your submission sent in. A lot of times we have people applying from abroad. They have to do a consular interview, and they might have an employment start date. And so now this is going to delay that. So that's where you really want to work with your HR team in the U.S. and abroad, for example, on an L1 managerial or executive visa to make sure that you get everything as fast and as thoroughly as possible and turn that around. And so the benefit of that is if you do submit it quickly, the turnaround time can be quick as well if you gave a thorough application. So sometimes we get responses within a week, um, and that would be a maximum of 15 days you would hear back from your RFP response if you use the premium processing. And so certain visa types, especially a lot of these employment-based, like the L1 or the O1, have premium processing option, which is where if you pay at the time of today's uh, presentation another $1,440 fee, you will get your response within 15 calendar days. So if you do get the RFE and you submit it, then it would be a 15-day turnaround from the time they get your RFE response. And so, Anthony, tell me a little bit about what an RFE letter might request. Well, it's it's really going to be targeted to the specific status. But for instance, if we're looking at an RFE for a non-immigrant employment classification, such as an H-1B or an L-1, 
Uh, generally, they're going to be asking for evidence to show that the petitioner and or the applicant meet the specific elements of that status. So, for instance, when you know you're talking about employment based, that documentation may be something along the lines of evidence associated with the petitioning employer, evidence associated with the particular job that the employer is petitioning for or evidence associated with the applicant, whether it's their employment background, their credentials, education, things along those lines, or it could also be a more immigration or security-based RFE where they're asking for specifics about, uh, let's say, an immigrant or intended immigrant's previous uh, stage in the U.S. Um, if a particularly if you have a beneficiary who's currently in the U.S. and requesting a change of status or an extension of status, they could ask for evidence to show that the immigrant has maintained legal status in the U.S. Uh, up to the point of submitting the application. So, th I mean, it, those are the, you know, the basic topics that usually come up. And again, as I think we'll get into a little bit further along, there are specific types of evidence that we often see come up, you know, targeted towards certain types of statuses. And so keep in mind the good news about a request for evidence is that they're telling you exactly what you want. And so they will go through the application and they will say, this is the evidence that you submitted to prove this particular element of your application and we still want more. So a lot of times what we're seeing lately is that even if we do put the evidence or we do put as much as possible, they're still going to ask for more. So what you have to do is just give them exactly what they're asking for. So what we do is read the letter, do an analysis, and then create an outline of what they're asking for. Then we have a call with the client and then we say, these are the types of things they're looking for. This is what we recommend you add, and then we'll brainstorm with the client and say, well, do you have any other evidence of this? Can you give us any other documentation supporting that? And so it's a real team effort, and it's a back and forth, and we will do that until we feel the application is ready. We'll, we will not submit it um, just because the client is rushing to do it. If it's not ready, it's not worth doing it and taking that risk that it won't be approved. But as you mentioned, the good news is it's all there, and you really want to work with an attorney who's done this before, knows how to read it and interpret it. Um, your eyes may glaze over when you read the response. It can be three to six pages of information, and you have to weed through and sort through that to find the, the gems and the real pieces that they're asking for. So what we'll do is create an outline and then use that in our cover letter and then the evidence will support under each category. And then we always recommend having a clear table of contents. So we have seen other applications um, that other firms have prepared that don't have this or it's not obvious. And so you want to keep in mind we have a government agent reviewing your application. They don't know anything about you or your job, or your company, or your industry, and we don't know what kind of day they've had, if it's a good day, a bad day, if you're the 15th application they've read today. So we want to always kind of spoon feed it, make sure that it's very obvious what you're trying to do, and that it is persuasive and argument, argumentative, and that we're showing all of the elements that you need that are required for your type of immigration benefit. So, Anthony, are there any times where a case might be denied outright and they're just going to skip over the RFE process? Yes, it can happen. Uh, generally, when that's going to occur is when either the applicant petitioner has submitted an application that is on its face unapprovable. So, you may have a situation, for instance, in H-1B where someone submits an application that, you know, perhaps um, is asking for someone to work there and that person has no experience, no degree, um, they're not paying the, the prevailing wage, you know, any, any major element of the case is just absolutely missing and there's no way that the applicant could present that, they could uh, just submit a direct denial. You also see that in cases where, let's say, for instance, it's a, a marriage-based case and the beneficiary has, for some reason, uh, 
perhaps it's a criminal violation, immigration violation that makes them inadmissible to the United States, those could be direct, uh, directly denied. Now, in our experience, we really have rarely seen that because USCIS will often at least give the uh, applicant a chance to, to prove their case, even if it's a case that has very little chance of ever being approved. Now, there has been an uptick that I have heard that certain cases are being denied outright if um, applicants don't do specific things. Now, that hasn't really been for like H-1Bs and L-1s. It's been more for uh, student-based cases, F-1s, where they have to maintain a certain status um, and they have not done that. Um, and then they've been denying those outright. So I think the majority will actually have an RFE. Um, and then, you know, more likely there would be cases where it would be something along the lines of a signature is missing or the uh, fee check is missing or incorrect, in which case they would just return the application. They wouldn't deny it. They wouldn't get it to an RFE. They would just return it and including the fee um, and ask that you reapply. So. So likely it would be something procedural or just a case that is never going to get approved even if you did do an RFE. So yeah, and then, uh -huh. oh yeah, no, I was that just going to say, yeah, yeah. And, and, and usually when that happens, it's a case where it's not just that the case is not approvable, it's that USCIS has a strong uh, suspicion that the applicant was submitting an application purely for purposes that weren't in good faith. So one uh, example that I have heard of for H-1Bs is where a company will send in like 10 applications for the same person hoping they game the system and beat the lottery, in which case they were denying them outright because they said this person clearly did not have uh, good faith in submitting this application. So in situations like that, they may deny it outright, um, but generally that does not happen. So you will have the opportunity to prove yourself a little bit more. So again, don't take it personally. This is part of the way that things are now. So we're telling our clients actually to expect one and to put that into their timeline to add uh, about two to four weeks to the timeline. And so we would want to submit the application earlier if we have that opportunity to account for this request for evidence. And we do have statistics of how much these have you know, tripled over the last four years or doubled, or we have seen statistics that nationals of India have received an 80% chance of receiving an RFE on an H-1B type visa, and that is because that is one of the most common countries uh, that apply for the H-1B. So um, we may not like it, but it is the reality, and it's just something that you should plan for and expect. And so what we do is take uh, the list of anything that has been put in an RFE and then we're putting it proactively in any applications for the future. But then what we've seen now is no matter what, they're still going to ask for something regardless. And we have even seen lately where they're asking for uh, certain documents but not even saying why you didn't need that prong. So what you do is don't act argumentatively and just repeat what they've requested for in the request. Put the, put the items there, and then address it. So you may say we have already submitted evidence that meets that prong, but in addition, we're going to give you this extra evidence as well. So if your case is denied, there are a few options. So one would be if you were to accept that decision and do nothing and move on, um, maybe apply again next year or at another time or for another visa type. There is also the opportunity to appeal with the Administrative Appeals Office, or AAO, um, but that's something we actually don't recommend. So number one, the, the decision time can take up to eight months, um, and we've never even actually been in that situation where we have had a client um, go through the full process because it takes so long. Um, and then you can file a motion to reopen the case. And so that would be if you believe the decision was an error or if new evidence has come to light that would support your case. And you would have to pay an additional fee. I believe it's about $110. Um, but the one that we would recommend the most would be to reapply with a new petition. And so, for example, we had a case where it was co-CEOs. They each applied for an L1A. And they had identical applications. So 
the male CEO was approved right away and the female received an RFE. So we submitted the RFE, I think it was about a 1,200 page application, and then it was denied. So what we decided to do, rather than appeal and waste time, was to just reapply again. It did cost um, more filing fees and more time, but it was, uh, she did receive an RFE again, and then ultimately it was approved. So all of this <laughs> we had done in about a month or less, and then she was able to come back and work. And this was at a multi-million dollar <clears throat> company. So um, we're just expecting anything at this time and you just have to be flexible and, and keep going and you will get what you're, you're trying to get. So for us, the approval rates have not gone down. We're still getting all our applications approved. It's just taking a little bit longer because of these RFEs. So Anthony, let's talk a little bit more about what they're typically looking for in the H-1B visa, since that probably has the highest number of RFEs. Sure. Yeah, and I, I would totally agree with that. And I think if you look at H-1B RFEs, the number one issue that likely will come up on almost all H-1Bs, even if the case clearly presents a approvable scenario, is showing that the job that's being requested requires a bachelor's degree, meaning that it is within the definition of a specialty occupation as required by the H-1B um, laws. And USCIS has recently in the past few years really honed in on this, um, basically because there are multiple ways that you can show that a particular job meets the specialty occupation definition. They are sending out RFEs, listing out every one of those elements and saying why an application doesn't actually meet it. Um, and they are finding creative ways now to show even cases that normally would require a bachelor's degree saying that it doesn't or that you have to present more evidence that it it um, that it actually is require a bachelor's degree. And I think the number one way they're doing this is they are stating across the board that they are relying on the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics Occupational Outlook Handbook to determine whether a job requires a bachelor's degree. And the OOH, the Occupational Outlook Handbook, has a lot of jobs in there and a lot of descriptions, but certainly not all the jobs and, and job descriptions. So a lot of times someone will have a particular position. Uh, we see it a lot in the logistics field because the OH has one definition for logisticians and that covers any logistics job that you can possibly imagine. So you might be a logistics engineer, you might be a computer scientist working in the logistics field, you might be a um, a supply chain manager, and all of those will fall under this one definition. Well, that definition under the OOH says that most of the positions require a bachelor's degree, but some do not. And USCIS has now taken the position that if that wording does not say explicitly that a bachelor's degree is required in most situations, they're defining that as it not showing that the bachelor's degree is required. So they are sending out RFEs for these types of cases saying you have to give us other evidence to prove that a bachelor's degree is the normal requirement because the OOH does not indicate that. Um, there have now been some core cases that have come through the, the pipeline in which judges are definitely taking a a suspicious view of that and, and essentially saying that that's not correct, but USCIS is still doing that. So that's the main thing that we see with a lot of RFEs in terms of H-1Bs. It's making the petitioner prove that the particular job actually requires a bachelor's degree. Uh, still common, but maybe to a little bit lesser extent, there will be RFEs that want evidence to show that the applicant actually meets the requirement that, you know, their degree is in a field that um, is similar to the job they're going to be doing because the requirements actually say that it can't just be any bachelor's degree. It's got to be a bachelor's degree in a particular field. Uh, again, they go back to the OH, and if the OH says that the particular position requires a bachelor's degree but doesn't give specifics or if the applicant's degree is in a different field, 
they'll set, submit an RFP essentially saying, well, you have to prove that the actual particular bachelor's degree that the beneficiary has is the type that would be specific to this field. And so that's another thing that we see with RFEs for H-1Bs. And then there's going to be more case-specific ones where they might want evidence to show that the company is financially viable and can pay the prevailing wage, or they may want specific documentation about, you know, in terms of the job description, things like that. So, but those are the two, that's the, the main thing really is showing that it actually is a specialty occupation, meaning that it needs a bachelor's degree in a specific field. And so some evidence that you can use to support that might be an expert letter. There are companies out there that work with professors and have someone in that specific field say, I've been involved in this field for this many years, I've had this many publications, and I believe that this type of job needs uh, a bachelor's degree or higher bachelor's, depending on what you're applying for. Other things would be to get job ads or job descriptions for a similar position, either within the company or they even like seeing from a competitor as well. So now we're saying this is common in the industry, and here are some examples of that. So let me ask you about salary. So the H-1B wants you to have a certain type of salary because what we're needing to show also is that this is not entry level, so it's not going to be your first job out of school unless it is something a little bit more sophisticated both in terms of job description and your salary. So there are um, classifications of the salary within a range and sometimes we run into an issue where we have a lot of clients in San Francisco and so the cost of living is going to be very different as it would be in another uh, city. And so we have to combat that sometimes, or we might ask our clients, you know, you're only a few thousand dollars off of a wage two salary. Do you have approval to move it up to that? And we have had clients actually go through and approve that. So, Anthony, when we talk about this wage level one, definitely that's something to think about at the outright before you submit your application in the first place. But if we get to the RFV stage, could they, um, since maybe now a few weeks have passed, would it be possible for the client to increase the salary and then put that new, you know, maybe a new pay stub or a, a letter signifying the change? Is that something they could do at the RFP stage? Um, it gets challenging at that point because the entire salary aspect of the H-1B is based on the labor condition application. Basically, the, the first step in the H-1B is filing an application with the Department of Labor, essentially telling the Department of Labor that you're going to pay a certain salary and to the beneficiary if they receive the H-1B. And, you know, you put what that salary is. Um, if you then get an H-1B, and going back to kind of what you were talking about, we've seen a, a trend recently where USCIS is essentially saying that if it's a wage level one position, meaning that the salary does meet the prevailing wage of the role, but it's at a level that would fall into wage level one, USCIS is defining that as a entry level position, and they are using some particular Department of Labor wording that essentially says that a uh, entry level position does not have the requisite level of responsibility and individual oversight that would require a bachelor's degree. And therefore, they are pushing back based on that. Now, if you get an RFE where they bring that up and you say that, well, we're just going to pay them more, I mean, th technically it could work, but I think more likely USCIS is going to say, well, you did not have this in the initial application, therefore, you know, we're going to deny it. Um, I think probably the stronger argument or response would be, number one, raise the salary and put that in there, but then number two, also push back on the argument about the wage level. And, you know, looking at, you know, reasonable scenarios, uh, way, a, um, an entry-level position certainly could be one that requires a bachelor's degree, and I think probably a lot do. And I think, you know, we often, when we have this issue, we like to bring up the example of a 
you know, a doctor or a lawyer. I mean, they could be in a wage level one position, entry level position, but obviously no one would say that that type of position doesn't require a bachelor's degree. So it's very general to say something like that, that USCIS brings up. And I think it's something that in most cases you can push back and say that even in entry level positions, a bachelor's degree is still required. And, you know, because of the underlying, uh, um, basically underlying skills and knowledge base for that job would require a bachelor's degree. So that's one way you can push back in another way. And Jennifer kind of alluded to this is the fact that you may have a wage level one position in San Francisco that if you transfer that exact same job and that exact same wage to say Chicago, it could be a wage level three position. So it's not really a valid way of assessing uh, um, you know, whether a bachelor's degree is required. And we have seen some success with that argument. Um, and I think it's an important argument to make. And I think it brings up an important point that just because USCIS sends an RFE and pushes back and makes these challenges does not mean that you can't then challenge those statements in the RFE and show why the law is basically on your side. The case technically could still be denied, but you at least could then use that defense in a possible appeal, or if you apply again, you know, you could use that too. So it's always worth making those arguments. Right. And you want to be looking at the big picture and saying what they're saying, does that really make sense? Take a look at the regulations. And we have a hand, handout that you can download on the last page. It has a citation to the Indicator's Field Manual, which is what the reviewing officer is supposed to look at. And they're human, so sometimes they might actually get it wrong, so we don't want to be, again, argumentative about that. We just want to say, this is the law, here's why we need it. And what we like to do also is show more than one argument. So just don't put one thing and then move on and hope that's going to be enough. In law, we want to use what we call belts and suspenders, which is where we are you know, putting as many arguments out there. So in case they think argument number one or number two doesn't work, we still might have argument number three and four. And so that way we're just being as prepared as possible. So let's talk a little bit about the L1A or the L1B visa. So the L1A would be for executive or manager positions where the person has worked for a company um, abroad for one out of the last three years and they're being transferred to the U.S. to be a manager or an executive. And then the L1B is someone with a specialty knowledge, perhaps of the company procedures or a certain department, and they're coming here to bring those procedures to someone here in the U.S. So we do a lot of these types of applications, and we're also seeing some patterns here, um, really pushing back on, is this person what you say they are? So they'll say, you say that they're manager, a manager, but just telling that to us alone isn't going to be enough. You need to actually show and spell it out. So what we recommend is showing work product of your um, the applicant's job abroad. So a lot of times they'll say abroad, we didn't know if you were really a manager. So you might want to show performance reviews that the applicant prepared for subordinate employees or any contracts that the person signed or meetings that they led or hiring or firing decisions. So anything that a manager would do, we would want to show that. And so what we'd also like to do is to diversify our evidence. And so we might have some contracts, some performance reviews, some emails, maybe a few other things, and then it looks diverse, it's a large application, it's organized, it all matches the table of contents in the cover letter, and then usually that is a good presentation. And keep in mind, presentation does matter. Um, Anthony can tell us the story about that. Um, but we find that if we do that and then have an impressive looking application, you can even get a response within five to six days from your receipt and, and as an approval. So Anthony, tell us about um, the time your client brought an application to an interview and it had a presentation that they liked. So you mean in terms of the L1 or? Um, when the reviewing officer didn't even read the application, I, I recall, right? Yeah, well, I've, I've had um, I've had multiple cases where I've had clients uh, report that the reviewing officer essentially will do a, a cursory look over it, and, and then that's it. You know, um, so 
And we assume probably at USCIS the same thing is occurring. You know, we don't know. It's a very opaque process. We don't know how they review applications or if they have a particular order, they do everything. Um, but, you know, we prepare every application as if, you know, it's somebody who is going to be going through it with a fine tooth comb. However, I think, you know, presenting an application with a lot of evidence, um, you know, my feeling, and this is, you know, certainly just based on my experience, is that if there's a lot of evidence, especially in a response to an RFE, you know, they may not review everything, but if they see that you have provided a lot in response as opposed to just a few pieces of evidence, then, you know, I think it looks a lot stronger. Now, I think what you're alluding to, uh, you know, the specific case was a marriage-based case. And, you know, this was at USCIS's field office and the officer explicitly said, you know, they came out to the applicants and said, you know, I'm just want you to know I'm approving this case on the spot. Now, that, that I think is very rare. And I think that was probably unique to that that officer. But one thing the officer did say that was very important is that they get. 10 applications a day that they go through and the majority of them simply do not have enough evidence for them to make a an educated decision on the case. They want to, but they can't because there's simply not enough evidence there. There's just it's it's not enough for any reasonable person to make a decision. So you really want to be thorough. It's very important. Um, the more the better. If they have too much evidence to go through, then that's not going to hurt you. Um, we have had people say that they've talked to attorneys or friends or whoever they're talking to that have this theory that if you submit too much evidence, they're going to deny it because they're mad that you sent too much paperwork. I absolutely do not believe that one bit. I think the more thorough you can be, the better, as long as you're organized, as long as the evidence that you're presenting responds to the the request, and it's not just throwing paper at them just for the sake of throwing paper at them. So. I was going to say that exactly. So we're not saying just yeah. put 500 pages of documents and, and hand it to them and hope for the best. No, we're assuming that they're going to read all of it. And I even go through and highlight the applicant's name on the documents. Like you're just handing it to them. Like here it is. All you have to do is read it. And the analysis has been done for you. We don't want to make them think. We want to have it explicit in our cover letter. We organize it by category with bold. Sometimes we even put color if we really want it to stand out. Um, and so assuming that they're going to read all of it, but in the event that they don't, it at least looks like it's all there. And in the table of contents, they can see that you've put all of this. And then we have tabs on the application so they can easily find what they're looking for and go back and forth. So um, again, we want to make that easy. And then if you are applying from abroad, you would get a second copy. Um, because they might send that to the consular post. And so from what I have heard from consular offices, they might be seeing 100 people a day. So you're going to get two minutes, and they're going to be um, sizing you up and making decisions based on how you look if you are uh, hesitating, if it looks like you're lying, if you don't have good hygiene, the things that officers have said they take into consideration when making appointments. So you want to have that officer look at your application and say, OK, wow, this person looks prepared. Because a lot of people aren't. And so that's an opportunity for you to stand out in the crowd. So a little bit more on the L1 visa. So again, it's going to be about your management duties. So you want to have the performance reviews, the contracts, things showing why you're a manager. And then for the L1B, things to show you in a specialist role. So if you're writing the code or the program for the company, you might want evidence of that. Or if um, you're an international logistics company and you use very complicated software, you might want to show evidence of your knowledge of that and then the company's internal procedures, because it might be complicated to train somebody new when you already know how to do it and you can come in and you can train other people here in the United States. So um, I think that is pretty much an overview of this process. And uh, we can help you with your application at the beginning. And we can also do second opinions. If you do get an RFE and you're not very confident about your response, or you just want someone else to take a look at it and say, do you think that we have given you, given everything in our response, we'll be very honest. And I would say almost every time 
someone comes to us, we'll say no. We wouldn't submit it at this point, and so we really push back until we're very confident. And so that's led to a very high success rate, and we're very happy when we get that approval notice for our client because this is their life. They want to come here and work in the United States, or they may already be here, and this is a renewal, and so you don't have time to mess around and not be doing something that's putting your best foot forward. So if you do have any more questions, you can put them in the comments below. We have a document that is a summary of all the things we spoke about today. And you can contact us at 323-450-9010 or find us at gradyfirm.com. Thank you so much. And thank you, Anthony, for all of your brilliant advice. And we look forward to working with you in the future.